Harold, you just gave the entire talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. One of the important things that we do as community is to recognize certain milestones that our members achieve. And so I'd like to take a minute here to uh, ask Travis to come up. Here he comes. Now what this is about is that Centers for Spiritual Living, our home office, our overall organization, uh, recognizes over 20 years of service and grants a title Practitioner Emeritus. And so we're recognizing Travis for that, but he's served in that capacity for closer to 30 years. So let's give it up for Travis. Being a, being a practitioner means you got to walk your talk, and it's never easy. And so persisting in this practice for that long really needs to be recognized and commended. So thank you, Travis. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I'd like to try something. Um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Claudine Whitaker. She was a, um, on the RSI side of religious science. Back in the day, she founded a tremendous teaching in Chicago and birthed Carlton Whitehead and Don Bird and a lot of other people that you probably haven't heard of, but they were giants in their time in terms of this teaching. And Claudine was known with starting her talks all the time by saying, God is in this place. And so I'd like to uh, invite you to participate with me in saying that. And I'd like you first to take a big deep breath. And if you feel comfortable, put your hands over your heart. And we'll do this three times by saying God is in this place. Ready? God is in this place. God is in this place. God is in this place. Now maybe that resonated with you. Some people don't like the word God. I encourage you to think of this as something, whenever something comes up for you, of thinking of a higher power, something that resonates with you so powerfully. You don't have to use God, you could spirit, universe, whatever it is. But when, you, when the ship hits the sand, Put your hands over your heart and say, God is in this place. And things will immediately shift. At least that's my belief and my experience. So you can try that out. So today's talk is you and me create society. And Harold, that sounds like a song that you could create. <laughs> At least for me, you know, it sounds like song lyrics. And, and you know, um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that We'll be talking about something and song lyrics will come into my mind from 50 years ago. But I won't remember why I came into a room. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it is, but music, and, and to be honest, most of the time I misremember lyrics. <laughs> and I go, oh my God, that's what they were really saying. <laughs> so you and me make society. And so regarding the society that we've created, who's responsible for this mess? <laughs> you know, I love that, that Facebook uh, clip. Many of you probably have seen it where the owner comes home and the house is a mess and the dogs are sitting there. And the owner says, you know, who made this mess? And they all look guilty. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, they'll point at the guilty dog. <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. And we have to recognize that we all have some responsibility in making this mess. And at the same time, we also have the responsibility for creating the most advanced consciousness that this world has ever seen. Technology, society, democracy, all of these things 
Technology, I mean, you've heard about the Webb telescope. We're now able to look back 14 billion years into history to see how the universe formed. I mean, this is an incredible uh, accomplishment. Just the technology of being able to do it, never mind the pictures that are coming back from billions of years ago. So, you know, we really have to take a look at that and understand that this is a seminal point in the evolution of consciousness. You know, even in the darkest times, some people have found a way to thrive. They see opportunities that arise seemingly out of nowhere. And I like what Wenda was saying about the Blue Abundance Program because it's not about money. It's about increasing that awareness of how abundant we are, how grateful we should be in terms of all the blessings in our lives and how far we have come as a society. So I encourage you to get involved with that because it'll shift your thinking and change your life. I know it has for me whenever I do this program is get into the habit of just being so grateful for things that come out of nowhere that reinforce this idea that you are divinely supported, that the universe has your back. But if you're not paying attention to it, you won't notice it. And that's what this is really about. Where do we put our attention? What do we focus on? And so I'm going to give a little Bible lesson. I'm not a Bible scholar, but there are probably three things that everybody needs to know about the Bible. First of all is Abraham. What was Abraham famous for? One. There's one God, one power. That's what Abraham was about. Second is Moses. The rule of law, how important it is for society to focus on the rule of law. Ten Commandments, right? And the third is Jesus. Jesus was about love and self-empowerment. He said, all these things I do, you can do, and more. What more of a powerful statement do we need? And yet, do we pay attention to those prophets that gave us these lessons? Do we really focus and bring our attention to those things? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Moses. Moses was a brilliant man. He was so brilliant, he was able to convince the Pharaoh to let his people go. Now, you can take the Cecil B. DeMille version of it, <laughs> let my people go. <laughs> um, and that's dramatic. But, you know, he had to convince Pharaoh to do that, to let people, the Israelites, go into a wasteland. So the Pharaoh's probably saying, yeah, sure, see how you do. And so Moses did that and took the people out of Egypt into this desert. And People that were formerly, formerly uh, enslaved now had all this freedom. And they acted out. They misbehaved, they acted out, they drank, they smoked, whatever it is they were doing, right? And Moses was a very spiritual man. He would go up to the mountaintop to pray, and he'd come back down, and you'd see all this nonsense going on. And so finally he, whether it was through divine intervention or however you want to look at it, came up with some rules, the Ten Commandments, to help society understand how you got to get along together. No more killing and murdering and coveting and all of that stuff. Very interesting that humanity needed that lesson, at least in Western civilization, to how to be with one another. What's interesting is poor Moses was exhausted because he was trying to manage this community and keep them alive, but he didn't have the consciousness to go to the promised land, probably because he was so tired. For 40 years of teaching anything, of trying to bring people into this realization that the rule of law is really important for us to get along as society, right? And, and so, you know, you look at that, he didn't have the consciousness uh, to free people from this concept of bondage. And so in a sense, they were in bondage to his management style, which was simply to keep him alive. But something had to change. The community was on life support, 40 years in a desert, 
doesn't bode well. And what do they say about babies? Failure to thrive because they don't get enough oxygen in their lungs. That kind of describes what these Israelites were doing is they were, weren't thriving because they weren't getting the oxygen of new ideas, new thoughts, new ways of being that would free them and allow them to step away from the desert into the so-called promised land. The people's consciousness shifted mostly because of Moses' teaching that this is really an important thing to pay attention to. And they brought their attention into a better idea, the idea of a promised land. And, you know, I, I think of that, and it's kind of like what's happening now. Whatever you may think about what's happening, whether it's outrage or anger or sadness, it demands that we come up with some way of thinking differently about what's happening. Where are we putting our attention? We need to come up with a new paradigm of how we can be together as society. That's really what it's going to take. And at the same time, it requires us to be very vigilant about where our own thinking goes. Because I can imagine a world that works for all and feel as though we're on the cusp of a huge cultural and spiritual breakthrough. I often find myself getting easily triggered by so-called politi uh, political and cultural setbacks that can bring great sadness and despair. And when I'm in that place, it's not very pretty. Uh, Greg Lavoie talks about this in his book, Callings. And he describes, at least for me, what I'm feeling very often when I'm in that place. He says, with the challenges of today's world, we can fall into a behavior that could be called emotional and spiritual truancy. Truancy, I love that word. It's like skipping out of school skipping out of the lessons that we're really here to learn. He goes on to say it's characterized by the evasion of one's own growth, the setting of low levels of aspiration, the fear of doing what one is capable of doing, voluntary, self-crippling, pseudo-stupidity and mock humility. No matter how sophisticated or ingenious the avoidance, and I know that one really well, it is still a cheap adaptation to the implorings of personal evolution. It is clinging to the trivial to cultivate our own little garden. Hmm, that hits me right here. To cultivate our own little gardens instead of stepping up into who we are truly here to be. Personal evolution is what we're really about. So when I'm in that place, I quickly remember God is in this place. God is in this place. And shift my attention away from what's not working to what is working that vibrates with the possibility of thriving. You know, that blue abundance thing, again, is a possibility of thriving. We have this teaching that can free us when we remember to use it and get a better idea. The science of mind philosophy has served us well to free us from uh, the idea of an angry, vengeful God to awakening to that personal power that Jesus promised us, that personal power in the creative process in the individual, the creative process in the individual. That power is surging through in as each one of us when we remember to use it. Here at Seal Beach Center for Spiritual Living, we're bringing our best love and attention to what's working. By clarifying our values of compassion, trust, accountability, and extraordinary respect, we're experiencing a shift in consciousness, in the consciousness of thriving together. We're awakening to find ways to engage with the community, to nurture, and embolden healthier, compassionate, and more loving relationships. And like anything that you want to become proficient at, what does it take? Practice, 
practice, practice, commitment, and an encouragement of each other. Harold Payne's song, trusting and loving one another. And when that uncertainty looms so powerfully in front of us, we need to double down on that commitment to our physical, spiritual, emotional well-being and the well-being of all those around us. That's the harder part, I think. Because for me personally, the science of mind is so focused, or at least it's been taught that way, for individual empowerment. But we're here for a greater purpose than just our greater well-being. The way that we relate to ourselves, one another, our world, all of it's interconnected and inseparable. We can't claim to love God while hating ourselves and others. We can't claim that it is a just and equitable world while creating or treating others unjustly and inequitably. I know that when I listen to this voice inside of me that can't give safe passage to someone, whether it's political or in my own family, if I can't give safe passage to someone, then I have to realize that there's no way that they can give safe passage to me as well. And that's where the trouble starts, right? When we say that there's only one life, that life is God's life, that life is perfect, that life is my life now, then what is the expectation? The expectation is that everything unlike that is going to show up. And we can't be upset with that. Right? I like this quote by Miriam Hasna. The universe is never testing you. It's simply giving you the opportunity to practice all that you say you are. The universe isn't testing you. It's giving you the opportunity to step into all that you say you are. So we've got to cultivate these skills of emotional and spiritual intelligence that requires us to experience the power of creative process in the community, not just creative process in the individual. In their book, Building a Church of Small Groups, a place where no one stands alone, Donahue and Robinson, the authors, remind us, few of us are trained from birth to be emotionally sensitive to other people's needs and responses. That's why you need to emotionally prepare people for the words that you say. You need it to enter a conflict situation willing both to speak and hear the truth, letting fear, doubt, worry loosen their grip. You know, clearly we can do better, I think. We can do better with one another, and as we do better with one another, Society at large does better with one another. From the perspective of emotional intelligence, change is not a problem to be solved, but a mindset to manage. Now, as religious scientists, we can relate to that because it's always about managing the mindset that we're working from, right? So we should be able to do this. Manage a mindset that at some point creates an opportunity for real dialogue real dialogue with an opinion that's different than what we hold. Dialogue is much different than conversation. It's certainly different than argument. And so finding a way to have dialogue to make sure that the other person feels heard. We don't have to agree with their point of view, but we really need to validate their point of view in terms of, if I'm understanding you right, this is what you're saying. And they may correct you. And that's a start to really understanding each other. Here's a quote by Nora uh, Bateson. The liminal realm in which we live, the transition, the change, the liminal realm in which we live is where the shifts are. Our integrity from one conversation to the next is everything. To take the risk of trusting each other is revolutionary and evolutionary. The question is, are we trustworthy? In this center, in the safe context of our care groups, 
We're learning to give voice to personal and community injustice and inequality so that we may learn how to break the mind-forged manacles of rigid and worn out thinking that we're all in, uh, imprisoned by. Breaking those mind-forged man manacles of saying this is how it is and insisting that no matter what you say, this is the truth. Well, you know, the truth is different for every person. It requires a mindset shift where, you're gonna love this, awkwardness and being uncomfortable um, is present and we need a way to feel it, to express it, to honor it and bring it to the group. I know what many of you are thinking, I'd rather stick needles in my eyes. <laughs> but this is the work that we're here to do if we want to evolve in consciousness and create the world that we, we desire. That awkwardness and that uh, idea that we don't want to share and be vulnerable um, is like what's called a threshold guardian. We see this big intimidating thing and maybe it's a dragon that's guarding a very precious jewel. And the idea of the threshold guardian, even though it seems intimidating and fearful, the guardian is simply there to guide us through the gate, to bring us toward that jewel that is within each of us that we'd rather not face. Last week, if you were here, Reverend Sunshine demonstrated that really dramatically by risking her vulnerability in front of us all. And what did that do? It brought everyone closer. When we have the competency not only to be vulnerable, but to accept vulnerability in others, things can not help but shift. This is how we connect with each other on a very deep level, to be curious, to be teachable, rather than judgmental. And what happens then is compassion and respect overflows into everyone's experience, into the larger community. What happened last week? Everyone felt inspired and supported and loved when she did that. I know you all felt that last week. So from that place, what do you think happens when we start practicing the science of mind principles? When we move into the creative process, freed up from all of those mind-forged manacles or whatever you call it, freed up from being afraid to share our vulnerability. We demonstrate more powerfully than we could ever imagine because we're coming from a, play, a clean place of expression, of not tapping into politically correct thinking or uh, old thinking or uh, how we should be thinking. We come from a place of tapping into source, into the creative possibilities of an infinite intelligence. I get excited about it. <laughs> I can't help it. We have richer living in every sense of the world, word. So it, this uh, quote really sums it up by Francis Weller. The work right now is to become immense. We have to get our arms around immense things. Violence and hatred and bigotry and racism. And also around love and compassion and devotion and a certain fidelity to protect what is alive. We have to become immense. This is not the time to become small. So as we travel through this month and the rest of the summer, I challenge us to free ourselves and reclaim our independence from worn out thinking by bringing the gifts of ourselves and engaging with our community like never before. And by doing that, the change that we desire in society can begin to take shape. I invite you to embrace the idea that a world that works for all begins with your next thought and your next action. 
and know that if it is an action that grows, expands, or deepens love, it's the right thing to do. And so let's close with prayer. Let's know this together, that everything necessary for the full and complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy, of community, of love, is here right now. That we are divinely inspired and guided to have the courage to speak our truth, to share our vulnerability and our willingness to be open to the other. I may not know how to do that, but I declare that there is something within me that does know it. There is something within you that does know it. And by action of this treatment, I call that forward in bold, bright, imaginative new ways that ensure a world that works for all. And so I invite you to close with me by knowing, as you put your hands over your heart, that God is in this place, and so it is.